I am Carissa Jekyll with Lock and Key, and here we are listening to the stories of survivors and advocates. Our mission is to give them a voice and you a new perspective. If you or a loved one is a victim of human trafficking, please call the National Human Traffic Hotline 1-888-373-7888 or text 233-733 help or info. This session was brought to you in part by Alpha Dog Agency in South Bend, Indiana. Be sure to follow them on Facebook and Instagram and check out their website at www.alphadogagency.com. Annie is the author of Throw Away Found, which is about her experience as a survivor of human trafficking and how she found hope and purpose through times of trials. Not only is Annie an author, but she is a retired teacher and musician, songwriter, and worship minister at Journey Community Church at Vallejo, California. Her worship music is available at www.anniemariemusic.com. Her new worship CD and her book will be available on Amazon and on her website, www.throwawayfound.com. My first question for you is, what would you like to be the theme of this podcast? My message to everybody out there is that there are many victims hiding in plain sight and survivors, and we need to be vigilant. And in caring and not afraid to get involved because human trafficking is all around us. Children are being taken and the most vulnerable are being hurt and we need to protect them. So that's why I wrote my book and that's why I come out as a survivor is to try and help people understand how fraudulent this is and how they they can be a part of the solution by helping others. That's beautiful. That's so beautiful. One question that I want to ask anybody who is on this podcast, what do you value? I value people. I value I value family people, um, caring for others. I don't care about getting rich. I don't, you know, I, for many years, I cared about getting rich or not, or just getting out of the gutter, basically, but, you know, getting, being, feeling like I wasn't worried about money and everything. But now the reality is I just want to help people and I want to bring people to Christ. I have tried every way to heal the wounds inside of me. The only thing that actually worked was Christ, was coming to the feet of our Lord and letting him heal me. After all these years of nightmares and terrors and insecurities, I have found health, mental health, basically, in my relationship with Jesus Christ. So if people are in need, I want to make sure that 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 door is open to them in a way that they can relate to. Awesome. Thank you so much. Now I'm going to ask about how you got into music and songwriting. And if you play any instruments, what instruments do you play? When I was young, I was, um, I played viola and fiddle. I always been really musical and I sang. And I loved it. It was the pretty. It was the only thing. I was quite nerdy, very, very smart. I got straight A's, but I was socially inept. Um, a good kid. That's pretty much why I was under the radar for most of my uh, young life. My parents were never worried about me. They didn't really, you know, they didn't pay a whole lot of attention to me. I just did my music. Um, after I was trafficked, I ended up alone and on the street you know eventually I started cleaning houses to get off the street and after um after I got and then I w- ended up with a job as a house mother which it was kind of a hippie thing to do um and involved with this I got involved with kind of a Hindu cult and so I was I started cooking and cleaning for a house um, in the Castro in San Francisco and I uh they heard me singing 
and they encouraged me. And so I started singing in bars, which did jazz for a while. I, I did all kinds of music. I, I'm part Asian, so I got into Asian Zydeco and I played with a band. I started writing songs for that band. I got involved with blues. Um, but I had a problem with it. The, and my problem with the music industry was that um, whenever I got to a certain point in whatever music I was doing, I would be kind of asked to, you know, strut and wear really high heel shoes. And, and it would bring up so much, so many memories that I just, I had a very hard time with it. So I, I never, I got, often I got to that almost making it point. But I just, and I, I just lacked the confidence and I lacked the desire to sell myself. Um, I had a definite aversion to, to going back to the feeling of, of being prostituted. And so I have a hard time with dressing provocatively. I have a hard time with, with wiggling my hips. I did it. And I, but I felt horrible. So, so now I'm, I've, changed my music. I started playing folk music and children's music and now I found religion and I'm a Christian and I've been using my music to praise God. And I find incredible joy in it. It's the most it's a it's a gift. So I'm really happy. I don't care if if my congregation likes the music, they sing it. I'm going to record it. Honestly I hope that people like it, but it's um, it's really a personal praise and a personal thank you to, to God. That's so empowering. So speaking of how you found your church, what led you to um, Journey Community Church? I um, actually received, I, I was an, totally anti-Christian. I was one of those people that would walk across the street to avoid anybody talking about Christ or religion. I considered, my, I, I spent seven years as a Hindu, uh, worshiping a, a ridiculous um, guru. What, looking back, I realized what a mistake that was. And then I tried Buddhism. I would meditate. I was I had nightmares from my experiences and um, sometimes terror. I would get frightened periodically and, and just have to kind of hide. And so I thought meditation, I tried all kinds of religion, but Christianity I had an aversion to. I was raised Catholic. And when I tried to go back, um, they were not kind and I did not feel welcomed. And so I, I got resent, I was very resentful. And I, uh, so I wasn't a Christian for decades and hated Christianity. Then my daughter, I had um, a daughter, and she started going to a youth group, not at Journey, but at Northgate, which is near me. And it's a wonderful church. It's, at that time, it was very small. And we, um, and I went just to kind of protect her because I, was, I wanted to make sure she wasn't being brainwashed the way I had been brainwashed and that, there were, that it was a safe place for her. So I started going, and my heart was touched. They were extremely kind. And they asked me immediately when they found out I was a musician to start playing in their worship team. And I played fiddle and um, they didn't really need my vocals at that point. So I just played fiddle. And the experience of worship is what really I'd been missing when I came to that connection with God. I realized that feeling of, of, Connecting in a such a personal and intimate way um, with Christ, it just at one point I just broke down in tears because it just was so healing. So I went to that church for a while. They got huge because it's a great church, out like twelve hundred people, and it got so that it was there was not really any room for an old lady fuller, <laughs> you know. And then the, so I started going around and playing at other churches just um, because I it was a non-denominational church. I just thought, okay, let's check out Christianity. I'm I'm a 
kind of, I'm kind of a nerd. I'm very scientific. I always want to, so I started checking out all these churches. Well, one church in particular, it was Journey Community Church. Um, they kept asking me back. And eventually they asked me to be their worship minister. Now, you can imagine my surprise at, um, here I am, an ex cooker um, and the person who's played lascivious music also, I would say, and danced around on stage in scanty clothing back when I had a figure. Um, and they knew that. I had told them I wanted to be on. I was at that point, I was being honest. And they wanted me to be their worship minister. So I, I, at first I said, no, there's no way. And then they asked again, I said, yes. And then I, that was when I started writing, uh, really writing worship music because I, this church is, is geared towards helping the, helping the brokenhearted, helping, um, the homeless, helping people we, have huge we give out food um we try and lift people up um and it's a i i believe in them very much so i wrote a lot of songs just about coming together and helping other people and uh so that's how i went to journey it's kind of a long story <laughs> wow really but, powerful um, oh my gosh. it's a great church and and tell me a little bit about how did teaching fit in there? I know you um, are retired now. When did you start teaching and what did you teach? Oh, my gosh. I um, Well, I actually taught. Well, I'll just give you a quick overview. I, I was, um, so I'd been house cleaning and then I was playing professional music. And I had this one incident that happened where I, I had this great concert at the Great American Music Hall in San Francisco. I got a standing ovation. I was just with this specific band. And then the next day, the manager called me and said, well, you did really well, but you know, there, I had this idea that you would, um, I mean, he put it in all kinds of cute terms, but basically he wanted me to have sex with him in order to stay in the band. I was so disgusted and it, because it reminded me so much of what I'd gone through when I was 17 that I quit music. I just said, I can't do this. Um, I have no medical insurance. Um, I'm living month to month. Sometimes the money was really good. And so, and I did a lot of traveling that I really liked, but I just said, okay, it's not worth it. All I, every time I get to a certain point, I have to sell myself again and I can't emotionally do it. So what can I do? I had started teaching fiddle to some kids and an adult who realized I loved it. And so I went to school and I went to college. I got my, I had already been going to school for, um, I'd gotten a scholarship to play viola in an orchestra because they needed it. And so I got my bachelor's in music because I wanted, if I was going to be a musician, I wanted to be prepared. You know? So then I went um, to San Francisco State and I, I got my teaching credential, my general teaching credential, and I got hired in, in Vallejo, California. And again, I was amazed and astounded that they would hire me. My self-esteem was extremely low. Well and the fact that they entrusted their children to me really helped me to start to, it's a very slow process of healing. Um, because I'd had a, at that point, I'd had a lot of really bad relationships with men, um, and I was starting, but so I really got into teaching. I taught um, for 28 years, and uh, I became an administrator in charge of professional development for new teachers, and I loved it, and but at one point, my health started to go downhill, and I had to retire. Thank you so much. Um, I think we're ready to start kind of that process of your story, if you feel comfortable. My first question on that is, at what age were you initially trafficked and how did that happen? I was trafficked at 17. My family was going through some issues 
and they didn't have it. My both my parents worked full time. They really kind of left me on my own completely. I got involved with the same Hindu cult that I got involved with in San Francisco, and um, and I was eating. Basically, I took that initiation from them and was brainwashed, and I was really into it. And they would so um, I was really smart, and so I I passed the um, the exit exam for high school, and I just. And I joined this ashram and the job that they had me doing was delivering cars to another city, which was a couple hundred miles away. And usually uh, we did it in pairs. So I wasn't by myself, but at one, one time it, I would did it by myself and I stopped at a rest stop. And this really cute guy, um, Look really, you know, some people just look safe, and that's why you have to be very careful. Um, he, you know, came up to me, offered me a, um, like a, it was like a lemonade drink, you know, and I was tired, and, you know, I was a young girl, and I was kind of lonely because I'd been driving all by myself, and uh, I took it, and I don't remember. The next thing I know, I was in this very Came to that place. And it was the trunk of a car, and uh, my life changed radically. Yeah. Um, I was taken to a brothel. So I went, didn't actually work the street. I, um, I danced, and they shot me between my toes with, uh, I think, I'm pretty sure it was heroin, and I was, I became a totally different person. Um, very different than the person that I ever wanted to be or ever thought I was. Um, they um, raped me many times, and uh, and there was a lot of verbal abuse. You know, they'd say, "Oh, now you're just a piece of me. you're just a piece of meat." It was just that. So, and that was. And it didn't, the thing is, is I came down with hepatitis after a while, after a few months, and they dumped me. And I am so, that is, at, you know, at the time, I, I was almost unconscious. I think they probably thought I would die there. And then somebody would just find me just a junkie on the street, and, you know. But, um, but I survived. Now, one of the people from the, the cult that I was a member of walked by and saw me and they actually took me and they called my, they actually, first I was just sleeping on the floor in a, a house. I don't even know where it was. Um, I was all ripped up inside and, and I was jaundiced with hepatitis and I was coming off of um, the heroin and I was like, throwing up all the time and shaking and, they were scared. They called my parents. Um, and my dad did come and get me. But they never asked what happened. It was like they didn't want to deal with it. No. Um, and I felt so dirty and so horrible about myself. Um, and what had what I felt like I had done. Now I realize. In retrospect, that I was a total victim, but I had decided to drive that car. You know, I hadn't, I, I accepted that thing. Um, and I felt, I felt like I ruined my life and I didn't want to be a burden on my parents. So at one point, I, when I called the ashram and they, and somebody came and they got me. And then um, some people needed somebody to drive to San Francisco. And so I took the job and I drove a car to San Francisco with two guys. And, that, and at that point, um, that point, basically, I was just a homeless person in San Francisco. You know, and we didn't have cell phones. So I had no way to contact my parents. I had no way to contact anybody. And they were mad at me because I had left 
twice now. They felt, I know they felt abandoned and they didn't like the changes in me. Um, being victimized like that, being beaten, being raped, it, it changes you. And I learned how to lie. Um, so I was afraid to say anything that would upset people because I was afraid of being hurt again, you know? So I, I got so that I would just try and say what people I thought people wanted to hear. So, so there was no honesty going on. I never said, mom, they gang raped me, you know, and she didn't ask. So she knew that I was bleeding terribly and she took me to the doctor, but nobody ever talked about it, you know? And how long was this going on? And I, it actually only lasted for four and a half months. It's amazing that such a short period of time, because I got hepatitis, I wasn't marketable anymore. And, um, you know, I was a com- commodity and my, my, I was, pa- and I was past my sell by date. They, I was already just a little older than most of the girls, did, which is horrible when you think about it. But then I was homeless for about a year, maybe got off the street, was a house cleaner for about two years. So I, I just had this hole in my past that I spent most of, I, I tried very, I had to cover. Yeah. Wow. Wow, that's so hard. I'm so sorry that you had to go through that. It will all be worth it if, if, if I can help somebody. That's my... That's how I feel about it. If some, because I mean, I, I, you probably have this statistic better than I do, but there are, there are some, you know, what hundreds of thousands of people right now being left in the world. And in the United States, in your city, in maybe even in your neighborhood, and you, you may not be aware of it, but there are people being trafficked. And you know, so if I went through that, I'm hoping that there's a purpose for it and that I can help some, someone else recover and, um, and find peace and understand that there's, there is evil in this world and we need to stand against it. And how, in, in your story, growing away from this, what was the biggest thing that helped you overcome kind of that shame or even just being out of the place of homelessness? I had a few people who helped me um, and that made a huge difference. You know, being able to be a house mother, um, having a place to sleep, not sleeping on just a bare floor. Just, I mean, I got a, I dug a um, space heater out of uh, a dumpster at one point. I had a, I find I had a pad, I had a sleeping bag, and I had a little heater in my bag of clothes. And that was, you know, the beginning of me attaining. I, I really put all my effort into some, attaining that lifestyle that I thought I wanted. So kind of that middle class. I wanted a husband. I wanted a family. Um, I wanted, I wanted to try and reclaim what I had lost. But I was kind of like, I was damaged and it was very difficult. So just that slow, periodically people helped me along the way. And I am I am very grateful. The only thing that actually really helped me though is when I, well, actually two things. Having my child helped me. And which is crazy. I wasn't supposed to be able to have kids. I was so damaged internally that they said I couldn't have kids. And then in my 40s, I became pregnant. I was so delighted that I married the guy immediately. And uh, and uh, having that child to care for and kind of started to bring me totally, that helped to heal quite a bit, you know, um, because I cared about her and I was not going to let anything hurt her. And so I kind of, 
I had it, you know, I let's face it, I had some bad habits from my days on the streets. I didn't use drugs anymore. I'd given all that up when I became a teacher. Um, but I still I still had I still kind of I don't know how to explain it. I I became a more moral person when when I had my my baby. And then um and then when I being a teacher, having my child, and then finding Christ. I mean, Christ is what healed me and allowed me to be honest. Because up until, gee, about 20, maybe, oh gosh, maybe three, three years ago, I was still hiding. I never told anybody, literally anybody. The only person, well, actually, I can tell you one other thing. The other thing that healed me was my husband. Um, because I always have these nightmares, or I don't anymore, but I always had these horrible nightmares where I was being held down and um violated or beaten. I had somebody tried to kill me by strangling me at one point when I was um after I'd been trafficked. And so I'd have I'd have nightmares about um some of the physical abuse I'd experienced. And uh, and my husband is the first man who ever uh, said, "Honey, what what are these nightmares from?" And I first was honest with him, and then I found that people were working against trafficking, and then I was honest with them. With, but that it's a fairly recent phenomena, <laughs> and it makes me wonder how many other people, how many other because it's not just women. How many other people are out there um, hurting? And if you were able to talk to one of these girls who were out there hurting, who are either a victim or a victim right now, what advice would you give them in terms of process of healing? I would take one of the biggest problems that you have when once something like this has happened, or at least for me, is that you don't trust anybody, um, and for good reason. So there were probably services I could have taken um, advantage of, but I didn't. I didn't trust anybody. I I was extremely um, reticent to take any help because if I took help, they would want something because they usually did. And in fact, I'd say ninety nine percent of the time at that point in my life. They wanted something and it was something I didn't want to give. And so I didn't take advantage of some of the opportunities or services that were available. So I would say you, you have to realize that everybody's not evil. Um, and you have to try your best to get away and to, and to find one of these organizations. There's pillars of hope. There's the, the, trafficking hotline, go ahead, call. There are people, I don't know if there were people back then, but there are people now who can help you. Um, because you can't really, it's, I mean, it took me decades. It's really hard to do it by yourself. You need help. And consider, consider a 12-step program and consider um, returning to your religion or looking at Christ as, as a help. Consider that, that, the, that there's a reason why so many people, uh, worship Christ because it works. If you were to talk to anybody who either didn't understand human trafficking or didn't see it as something that's a huge cause in the U.S., what would you say to them? That is so hard because honestly, so many people that I know, um, I mean, they say human trafficking, they don't even think about prostitution. You know, they, they, it's almost like they cleaned it up by calling it human trafficking or they don't call it slavery. Um, it's, and on, if you watch the shows on TV, they make it almost look glamorous sometimes. I want them to understand it is not glamorous. And that girl who's smiling at you is smiling at you because she's afraid that if she doesn't, 
she will be tortured. She has been brainwashed to think she has to do this, and she has, and she desperately needs to be saved. Think about how you would feel if your daughter was seduced out of her high school and then forced into prostitution. Think about how you would feel if your little boy was being brutalized. These are people's children. These are people, these, the, and so they are people's children. Maybe some of them have been rejected by society, but they are our brothers and sisters and we owe them, we owe them. They, they need to be taken care of. Um, those people who think it's, you know, that it's some, oh, well, they want to do that. Or I promise you, they don't want to do that. I promise you, they have to in order to survive. And they will choose, they would be, let's give them a choice to do something else. And those people out there who think it's okay to, um, because this industry would not exist if it did not have many customers. So at some, we need to, we need to humanize sex workers and victims so that people understand that they, that if they use the services, if you pay for those kind of services from another human being, you are in, you are involved in slavery. You are involved in absolute oppression. You are one of the brutal, evil people in this world. And, and you need to take a look at yourself. And, you know, sex addiction is, is a huge part of our society. And we need to kind of put it in its place, you know, along with alcoholism. People need, you know, drug addiction, the addiction to gambling. These are addictions. They should not be supported. Well said. That was beautiful. So tell me a bit more about what made you want to become an author. Tell me more about what the book is about and just in general, what decided to get you started on this book. And if you have any other books that you have published before. I have not published any books. I'm a new author. And um, I always kind of wanted to write a book. I tried to write a couple of books at one point, but they were just, um, they were kind of like along the lines of sex in the city, you know, little weird things. And I, I did, I realized that I didn't want to, that wasn't really what I was about. I, I have this need inside of me to do good. And I thought, why work on something that's not going to be a positive influence? So I didn't write. And, uh, at one point I've had an operation. I've had a bunch of operations in the last five years and I was afraid of this one and I because they were biopsying my lungs I do have a type of cancer and they I was I was right thought maybe I would die and I said look Lord I'm not ready to go what do you want me to do um what do you want me to do tell me what you want me to do please I'm not ready to go I had I just had this weird feeling and I got so clearly that I said Tell your story. So, Thrown Away Found is my story. It's very personal. Um, it is, I don't go into morbid detail, but, um, but I, I am honest about what happened and my struggle out. And then at the end, I talk about if you're hurting, ways that you can, through meditation, through connection with God, Start to heal yourself. I talk about the healing process in the last half of the book as I experienced it, hoping that it will give some folks a, an idea and to a, a, just help them to accept the healing that is offered. So um, it was a hard book to write because I had to remember everything as I went through it. And it was especially hard for my husband to read. <laughs> I had him read it first and then I rewrote it. He wrote it, he, he read it and he said, this is the most depressing book I've ever read, except for the very end. And I went, oh, 
So I took some things out and moved some things around and I put humor. I tried to put some humor into it because it, there were some very humorous situations, you know, in moments. Kind of like I was walking up the ladder and it was on the wrong house, that kind of stuff. You know, it's none of us are perfect. And I'm especially imperfect. And I recognize that in your book. Um, I hope people. I hope you, I, if only one person finds hope in that book, it will have been worth what I read. And to those who do read it, what message would you just give to them personally in the process of, of reading your story, whether they be a victim or somebody who doesn't even know about human trafficking? I just ask all people to keep an open mind um, and to and just to listen to just to listen because. You cannot judge people by their appearance. If you meet me on the street, you'll say, oh, there, she's a retired school teacher. I look like a retired school teacher. You have no idea what's in my past. Every human being is like that. So as you read my book, understand that you, you may not know. We don't know everything. There is much that's hidden in so many levels. And one of the things that's especially hidden are people's hearts. You know, what they've gone through. We don't, people are not really very honest often because they don't want to be rejected. So we need to, as you read my book, realize that I'm laying myself out for you because I'm hoping that you'll understand that we are all in this together. We need to join together and help our brothers and sisters find healing and and help to really take a stand against the exploitation of of children and and adults. That's amazing. Thank you so much. What what are the other messages or thoughts that you have to share that I either haven't asked you about or you want to kind of clarify or go further in depth about? Or what other concluding statements would you have if not that? I just want to say thank you um, to you. And also to anybody watching this for giving giving me your attention and your time. Um, we have we have work to do, and there's so much needed. So if you feel the slightest desire or hug on your heart to help, please do so. There are organizations that are helping victims of human trafficking. Let's let's work with them and. It's a tricky, it is a tricky subject because remember, a victim is or survivor is going to be hiding. They're hiding from their pimps, they're hiding from from society, they're hiding because they don't want to be hurt anymore. So we need to kind of help them to accept their past and to, and to take the healing that's offered. And I just would like to tell any any woman who is or any person who's recovering or who's who's thinking about getting help from being trafficked or victimized, beaten, hurt, abandoned. I just want to let you know I'm telling my story because it's decades ago now and and I feel I'm in a safe place. I am I am not in any danger anymore from the people who victimized me. You do not have to do that. You can come out and ask for help without going on a podcast, without going into the gory details. You've been victimized, and that's all you have to say. It takes time to heal from these things, and it takes time to uh, to deal with the trauma that you have experienced. And that's okay. And the people in Pillars of Hope, the people at the hot trafficking hotline, they understand this. So just because I'm on a podcast and telling you this story, you do not have to do that in order to get the help. Okay? It takes time. Thank you, Annie, for sharing your story and being a light in the darkest places. Be on the lookout for her book, which can be found on Amazon and on her website, www.throwawayfound.com.